Our speaker this evening uh, is Clarence Deloach. He is in his 68th year of preaching the gospel. And I'm not going to try and figure out how old he is based on that. I'm going to assume just 69. Um, but he has conducted over 700 gospel meetings in 35 states and six foreign countries. And actually, I misstated that because on this bio it says 68, but then there's a correction that says 72. So I don't know how he started preaching before he was even born, but he did it somehow. Um, but he currently serves as an associate minister for the Sycamore Church in, in Cookville, Tennessee. And I, to say something about Clarence, uh, to use two words to sum up Clarence Deloach, I would just have to say he is a Christian gentleman. And I, I just don't really know a finer compliment that I could give a person. You, you wouldn't find a greater Christian gentleman than Clarence Deloach. And I, I appreciate him and, and his encouragement of me and, and preachers everywhere and brethren everywhere so very much. And so if you would give your attention to Brother Deloach now as he speaks to us on United in Maturity, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 9. Well, I have been coming to this place since the mid-70s. And I'm joyful to be here tonight. I appreciate the invitation. You know, when you get as old as I am, any invitation is good. So it's good to be here, and I appreciate the work that's being done here. I was thinking this afternoon about uh, all of the directors that I remember. I believe Brother Clifford Reel was the first one that I recall when I first came here back in the 70s. Then I remember Brother John Waddy. Of course, I remember David, Brother David Farr. I remember Brother James Meadows and David Leib and uh, several others. And uh, I appreciate Will very much have good conversations with him from time to time, and it's always a great joy. Now, I don't have any PowerPoints tonight, but if there's one thing that I like better than PowerPoints, it is for you to open your Bible with me. I like for people to open their Bibles and study along as we preach. And uh, tonight I've been given this topic, United in Maturity, and the text is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 9. I'm going to read the first three verses of this chapter, and then we'll get into our study. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like men? That's the way the Apostle Paul introduces this paragraph from which we're studying tonight. Please observe that while the Corinthian church was a church beset with so many problems. And I have an idea that this study this week here at this lectureship is going to be a great blessing to all the congregations that are present for this study because we have problems in the church today. In fact, as long as the church has existed, there have been problems. But I'm grateful here in this text that the Apostle Paul, though he's going to identify those problems, he's going to describe those problems chapter after chapter, he still called them brethren. Neither Paul nor the Lord had given up on the Corinthian church. As a matter of fact, at verse 2 of the first 
chapter, Paul identifies them as the church of God at Corinth. And while they were brethren, Paul could not describe them as a spiritual people, but as babes in Christ. Now, there's nothing wrong in being a babe in Christ. Every new convert is. We all were when we became Christians. The problem is remaining a babe. This was the same problem that the Hebrew brethren had. And the writer identified that problem in Hebrews chapter 5 at verse 12. For the time you ought to be teachers, he said, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've become such as need milk and not strong meat because you're not able to bear it. It's wonderful to know that we serve a God who is patient with us. God is a long-suffering God. God is patient with us and gives us time to grow. For at the time, you ought to be teachers. God gives us time in which to grow. Now, milk is good, and milk is necessary. But in time, we should graduate and progress to the point that we can take some solid food of the gospel. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that they might grow thereby. 1 Peter chapter 2 at verse 1. Sometimes when a little baby is born into a family, they get all excited and they want that room to be a very special room. They get exactly the right color they want. They have all the decorations there. But one thing for certain, that baby is not concerned about the decorations. That baby wants the milk. And so Paul here in 1 Corinthians describes three kinds of men, three kinds of people. He talks first of the natural man. In 1 Corinthians 2, he spoke of the natural man not receiving the things of God. Who is the natural man? Well, the natural man is the person who seeks to understand the things of God apart from divine revelation. And Paul goes on to say that the things of God have been revealed to us. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the hearts of men the things God has prepared for us. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. The spirit searches the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man that is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man save the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things freely given to us of God. We'll never understand the things of God apart from divine revelation. But he talks about a second kind of person, the carnal man. He identifies that man here in these verses I've just read. Who is the carnal man? He's the Christian who lives like the man of the world. And then thirdly, he describes the spiritual person. Here in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, I could not identify you as spiritual people, but as carnal. Who is the spiritual man? This is the person who has the mind of Christ. This is the Christian who is led by the Spirit and loves the things of God. Now, Paul described their carnal status. He said, there's envy among you, there is envy, and there is strife, and there is divisions among you. Then aren't you carnal and behaving as mere men? Every chapter in 1 Corinthians discusses a unique problem in this church. Chapter 1, following their preachers and their teachers. Chapter 2, looking to the wisdom of this world rather than the wisdom of God. Chapters 3 and 4, a failure to imitate the faithful among them, men like Paul and Timothy. Chapter 5, glorying in the sinful conduct of a brother rather than exercising loving and caring discipline. Chapter 6, litigation before heathen judges. 
rather than working things out among the brethren. Chapter 7, a failure to practice divine principles of marriage. Chapter 8, problems of conscience having to do with eating of meats that had been offered to idols. Chapter 9, the importance of discipline in body and in mind. Chapter 10 and 11, improper conduct in the worship of the church. Chapters 12 through 14, immaturity in the exercise of the spiritual gifts. Chapter 15, confusion and questions relating to the resurrection. And chapter 16, some problems relating to even the contribution. Now, all of these problems were symptoms of a deeper problem, and that is a lack of spiritual maturity. I'm convinced, after my experience preaching all these years, that our problems in the church generally are due to spiritual immaturity. Most all of our problems can be traced back to that problem. Now, what can we learn from the Corinthian situation? First of all, let's recognize the fact that the Corinthian church improved. The Corinthian church did better. Paul, very much like the writer of the book of Hebrews, was confident of better things concerning them. Hebrews 6 at verse 9. And chapter 13, verse 22, the writer of Hebrews said, I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation. What's he saying? Listen to these words that I've written to you, these inspired words from God. Bear with the word of exhortation. While there's a lot of rebuke in the book of Hebrews, the primary purpose was to encourage, to exhort the brethren, to get them to turn around and begin to make progress spiritually. He believed that they could overcome their problems and grow out of their childish ways. And they did, and they did. And that's evident when you read the sequel, the second book of Corinthians. In fact, that brother, you recall, who was living with his father's wife, a sin not even named among the Gentiles, had repented. And in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, Paul urged the brethren to receive him and to forgive him. And he gave this reason, lest Satan should take advantage of you, for we're not ignorant of his devices. The tone I see in the second letter is one of triumph. Chapter 2 at verse 14, for example. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ. And this is a beautiful statement. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. There is a fragrance about Christians who are maturing in Christ Jesus. There is an aroma about God's people who are making progress in the faith. But now, what were the contributing factors to their immaturity? When Paul came to Corinth, the Lord assured him that he had many people in that city now, obviously, God is talking here about those that he knew would believe, those who would receive the message, Acts 18, verse 10. Aquila and Priscilla were already there. They'd been driven out of Rome with other Jews. And Paul entered, we're told, into the house of justice next to the synagogue, and Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, was converted with his household. And Luke reports, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Acts 18, verse 8. And with that nucleus, the church was begun at Corinth. And though the Apostle Paul stayed there for a year and a half, that church had a difficult time growing. What were the obstacles that hindered this church from growing? Obstacles they needed to overcome. 
Well, some of those obstacles had to do with their environment. As you know, Corinth was a morally bankrupt city. And being a commercial city, gross immorality, drunken debauchery flourished there. Many of the Corinthians had practiced those sins, the sins of their environment. And Paul specified those sins in 1 Corinthians 6. Fornication, idolatry, adultery, effeminacy, homosexuality, adultery, stealing, covetousness, drunkenness, reveling, extortion. Sounds pretty current, doesn't it? And Paul added, such were some of you. And by their reception of the gospel, they were washed, they were sanctified, and they were justified by the blood of Christ. Now, tonight let's make our study just as personal and just as practical as we possibly can. Because like the Corinthians, we too face so, so many challenges that often keep us from a life of growth, a life of victory, a life of maturity. We face essentially the same problems they faced in our culture, our society today. What are they? Basically, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Satan's singular purpose is to deceive and destroy. Satan is hostile to the church and the things of God. And Satan uses the flesh and he uses the world to tempt us to live in immaturity and to render us just as weak and ineffective as possible. Years ago, I lived in Marietta, Ohio with my family, preached for the 6th and Washington Street Church there. Down about two blocks from where I lived, there was a grand old preacher. His name was Fred E. Dennis. Some of you might recall that name. For many years, he wrote articles in the Gospel Advocate, the Bible Herald. I heard him preach a sermon one time that I've never forgotten. Very simple sermon. The title of it was, Three Things the Devil Wants to Do. And here were the three things he talked about. Number one, the devil wants to keep you out of the church, and he'll do whatever he can to blind your mind to the truth of the gospel. But number two, perchance you become a member of the body of Christ, then the devil will do his very best to get you to go back into the world and number three, and perhaps it's right here that he's been pretty effective. You know, the devil's shoes don't squeak. He's been at it for all these centuries, and he's good at what he does. Number three, he'll try to render you just as ineffective as he possibly can in the church. And I look around and I see that's happening and Satan is behind all of those efforts. And for those reasons, Paul warned in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, therefore, that is, in view of all of this, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10 at verse 12. Now think with me about these three enemies for just a moment. The flesh is the internal foe. Paul said to the Corinthians, you are still fleshly. The flesh in this context is not the flesh that covers the bones. It is that humanness about us. It is that propensity to sin that is within all of us. Now, when we were saved through the new birth, we became new creatures if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But that does not mean that the flesh is eradicated. As long as we live, we're going to have to fight the flesh, this propensity within us to sin. Paul put all of this, I believe, in proper perspective in the book of Romans chapter 6. In that great treatise, the book of Romans, he said this, therefore do not let sin 
reign in your mortal bodies. Now he's talking to Christians. Those who had died to sin had been buried with Christ in baptism, had been raised to a newness of life. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I love verse 16. Do, do you not know that whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience unto righteousness? There is always that possibility. The flesh is always there. And so we need to keep in mind, here is one of our greatest enemies. Paul dealt with the same problem with the Galatians. He wrote, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. Galatians 5 and 13. In their immaturity, they were biting and devouring one another, he says, rather than serving one another in love. So the flesh is the internal enemy. The world is the external enemy. So many in the church, I think, have thought of the world and worldliness in very narrow terms. When I was growing up, about the only thing that we heard about that was worldly was dancing, drinking, immodest dress, and a few other forms of licentiousness. But I want to tell you, while those things are symptoms of worldliness, worldliness is much, much deeper than that. It's looking to the world to define our standard. It is looking to the world to define our goals and our values. And for that reason, Paul said to the Romans, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So the world in this text translates a Greek word that literally means in English, cosmos. What is it? It is an order. It is a system. It is entrenched and systematized network of ideas designed to enslave and trap us. This world has a prince. Several times Jesus talked about the ruler of this world. John 12, 31. John 14, verse 30. And in 1 John 5 at verse 19, John says that this world is held in the sway of the evil one. Let me tell you that Satan has this world system in his arms, cradled, rocked, and swayed by him. This world not only has a prince, Paul called him the prince of the power of the air, this world has a philosophy a culture of values, all designed to destroy our faith. So the Bible speaks of the spirit of this world, 1 Corinthians 2 and 12. The wisdom of this world, 1 Corinthians 3, 19. The fashion of this world, 1 Corinthians 3 and 31. The pollution of this world, 2 Peter 2 at verse 20. Don't you sense it every day? When you turn on the television, you watch a movie or whatever, the news, even religion, you see this philosophy of this world. It may seem innocent. It may seem harmless, but it's the philosophy of this world, carefully crafted and led by the master deceiver. It has a purpose, a prince, a philosophy, a purpose. It is hostile to the things of God. Now, we understand that Satan's primary war is against God. But when you commit your life to God, he's going to be after you too. Jesus warned, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. John 15, verse 18. And James warned 
To be a friend of this world is to be an enemy of God. James 4 at verse 14. But this world has a people. Jesus spoke of the sons of this world. Luke 16 at verse 8. You know, Christians are twice born people in a world of once born people. Our faith begins at a different source. Our faith continues on a different course, and our faith ends with a different conclusion. Let's remember this. We are residents of the human world. We live in the physical world, but we're not a part of this satanic system of this world, for we have been called, called out. That's church, ecclesia called by the gospel to be a consecrated, sanctified people. Now, Paul used 15 chapters in 1 Corinthians to specify and describe their spiritual immaturity. The tone of the letter was primarily rebuke, but it had a positive purpose. And that positive purpose was to lead them to repentance and correction and growth in their lives. Now, at the end of the letter, he gave them some imperatives that would correct their immaturity and unite them on the path of growth. I think one of the most powerful and positive statements, and I, I would suppose every preacher here has preached on this text a number of times, but it is a powerful passage, and it's found here in the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 13 and 14. Listen as I read. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Yes, one of the greatest challenges facing the church today is spiritual immaturity. Just think of the vast numbers, brethren, among us who are content to live on the fringes. They never really participate. They really never get involved. They don't seem to know what it means to have a sense of belonging, to be a part. But I ask can these conditions be reversed? Those conditions at Corinth could be reversed. And Paul believed in them and gave these positive, powerful imperatives here at the end. Let's look at them very briefly. Be vigilant, aware, and alert. That's the first one. The problem they had was spiritual stupor. In fact, they were spiritual zombies. They were asleep. They needed to awaken out of sleep. You know, we never are more vulnerable to Satan's devices than when we are listless, when we're filled with apathy and indifference. Even an unforgiving attitude gives Satan an advantage. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 11, resolved, unresolved anger gives a place for the devil, Ephesians 4, 26. So we must always be aware of the danger of temptation, aware of the paralysis of indifference and the seduction of false teachers. Watch, be alert, be aware, be on guard. They needed to hear that from Paul here at Corinth, and it seems to me, that's good for us as well. Remember what Jesus said about false prophets. He gave a double barrel warning. Take heed and beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Matthew 7 at verse 18. Number two, be firm in the faith. That's what they needed. That's what we need. Now, faith in this passage is not personal believing. Faith here is that word for the gospel, for the truth of the gospel, that body of divine revelation that God has given to us. Like the Ephesians, the Corinthians were being tossed 
carried about by every wind of doctrine. They were flippant and vacillating. And sadly, too many among us are not settled, not established in the faith. We're not growing in the faith. And consequently, we're vulnerable to anything that comes along. It is spiritual immaturity when anyone today attempts to interpret Scripture through the lenses of culture. And that seems to me to be one of the problems at Corinth. That's why Paul warns so much about the wisdom of this world versus the wisdom of God. After all, it's the truth that makes us free. John 8, 24 and through 36. Now, thirdly, he said, behave and grow up, act like men. The Corinthians were acting like children. In fact, in chapter 14, at verse 20, Paul said, in malice be children. You know, children can be playing and they can fight and disagree. And in a little while, they're reconciled and playing together again. In malice be children, but in understanding be men. You know, maturity is seen in a growing commitment to the Word of God. Maturity is seen where there is spiritual discernment, where, where we learn how to make decisions based upon the truth of the Word of God. That's discernment. And it is seen where there is emotional stability in our lives. It is seen where we're growing in our personal relationships. And it is seen as we morally become purer and purer in heart. And then number four, he said, be strengthened. Observe here that the verb here is in the passive voice that implies that the strength that we must have does not come of ourselves. It does not come through the power of the flesh. It emanates from God and not from us. And so we need to submit to God in reception and obedience. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. The Apostle Paul had it right when he wrote to the Philippians and he said this in chapter 4 verse 13. I can do all things, but he didn't put a period there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And listen, when we wait on the Lord, yielding our spirit to his spirit, we are strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Ephesians 3 at verse 16. Now I want you to notice this last injunction. How powerful this is. Be motivated by love in all things. Paul had talked about that in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, Without love, even what we do is fallacy. What we say is fallacy without love being the motivating factor. Brethren, it's love that gives balance to all of these injunctions. We need balance. We need balance in our lives. We need balance in the church. We need balance in our preaching. Think about it for a moment. It's love that keeps firmness from becoming harsh and ugly. It is love that keeps strength from becoming domineering. It is love that makes maturity gentle and considerate. It is love that keeps doctrine from becoming dogmatism. It is love that keeps moral living from becoming smug self righteousness. This agape love that Paul talks about here and in chapter 13 is that love that seeks the best for others. It is that more excellent way that Paul mentioned at the close of chapter 12 and goes on to describe in chapter 13. I ask as we close our study tonight, are you a maturing child of God? I didn't ask, are you completely mature? Because I believe that there is room for improvement in all of us. It matters not how long we live, how long we study, how long we preach, how long we serve the Lord. 
There's always room for improvement. Even the great apostle Paul could say, I have not yet apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I press on toward the prize that is before me. Paul encouraged the Philippian church. I think most of us would think and would agree that the Philippian church was one of the best congregations that we read about in the New Testament. And yet, it was not perfect. There were two women who couldn't get along. And Paul implied that there was perhaps some need for greater confidence in their faith. For example, he said in chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, God wants to finish what he started in you. He wants to finish what he started in me. He does not give up easily on us. The Lord does not give up easily on his church. And where there are imperfections and immaturity, God wants us to grow out of those things and become a mature people. And so let your will be yielded to his and let us all unite in maturity. Now, how does maturity really look in practical terms? Maturity is the ability to control anger and settle differences without violence. Maturity is patience and a willingness to pass up immediate pleasure in favor of long-term gain. Maturity is perseverance, the ability to sweat out a situation in spite of opposition and discouraging setbacks. Maturity is the capacity to face unpleasantness, discomfort, and defeat without collapse. Maturity is being big enough to say, I was wrong. And when you're right, the mature person need not experience the satisfaction of saying, I told you so. Maturity is the ability to make a decision and stand by it. Maturity means dependability, keeping your word, coming through with courage. Maturity is the art of living in peace with what we cannot change, the courage to change what should be, and the wisdom to know the difference. May God help us to unite in maturity. I'd like to end our lesson tonight with a statement from the great apostle Peter. As you know, Peter was faltering. Peter had difficulty getting both feet in his mouth. The Peter that we read about in 2 Peter is not the Peter that was introduced first to Jesus when our Lord called him. And when you read 2 Peter, you see how this apostle of our Lord grew and developed. You see how he mellowed in the faith. And his last words, 2 Peter 3 at verse 18, are so powerful. He said, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, unto whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Those words should challenge each of us tonight. Maybe there's someone here tonight who has not named the name of Christ. The Lord wants you to be a part of his kingdom. He wants to bring you into the body of Christ. But he wants you to mature and grow. You'll be a babe first. And but by taking advantage of those resources he makes available, you can grow and have victory in your life. I've, I've thought about how many people who are 20 have grown more than some who are 40 or 50. Why? One may accelerate his or her growth and maturity by taking advantage of all the resources that God has made available to us. Get into the Word. Get into the Word. Here is our nourishment a life of prayer, a life of service. 
winning souls to Christ. All of those are activities but resources from which all of us will mature and grow into the likeness of Christ. Maybe I'm speaking to some tonight who have wandered away. Maybe immaturity has been a problem in your life. Come home. The Lord wants you back, and he wants you to mature, and he makes everything possible for you. Let's be a maturing body of Christ so that one day we'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Can we help you tonight as we stand and as we sing?